most of us, we spend more time with our coworkers and our bosses, right, than we do with our own families. So if we can't have that open lines of communication, granted, doing it at the right times as well, too, not always like where my mouth gets me in trouble like we just spoke about, but that needs to be there. Otherwise, what are we doing, right? I mean, everybody's like, well, it's just a job. Go to work, do your job, and go home. But we spend a majority of our living life at our job. Why can't it be a little more, right? You know, why can't we have those open lines of communication, good or bad? Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Jaded Mechanic Podcast. I got a new friend with me, um, Mr. Chris Higgins. Doing very well, Jeff. How about yourself? Uh, very good. I had, um, a, we're starting to finally wrap up tire season. And um, tires is hard on my on my shoulders, my elbows, my knees, the whole thing. So it's uh, the other night there, I I went to bed at probably <laughs> I hate to admit it, probably seven thirty. Um, didn't sleep sleep well. The the meds I took for for the muscle pain, I had a reaction to, and I was up all night, you know, in in agony. Just um, it didn't agree with my stomach. So yesterday was a complete day of just stay in bed and try to get caught up on the rest that I missed the night before. And um, today I feel a hundred times better. So it's just, That's, it's tire season, right? It sucks. So right, yeah, it. Uh, funny you mentioned that too. There on, I believe it was Wednesday. I had kind of just a big, heavy, heavy job week. So like I had a Ford three quarter ton, you know, and um, ball joints, track bar, ball joint, tie rod ends, you know, the drill. Yep. Um, and then followed up by a, a one ton gasser, the you know the V10, the Triton that needed spark plugs but they hadn't been done before nine out of ten broke um so <laughs> yeah i was really really wrenching this week and i went to bed not feeling too bad and then i woke up one morning i was just stiff as heck but i still made uh still made my morning walk and kind of loosened up again but yeah definitely not as young as i once was um definitely not super old yet but you know i could care less really if i did ball joints much anymore <laughs> yeah i'm the same you know like guys guys get into the Oh, I hate Diag or whatever. But when I think about like what it does to the body to do a day load of tires or a day load of, of front end, give me the Diag, man. Like I can, the, the, the stress I can handle um, all day. Yeah. All day. It's the, it's the physical thing that when I go home, I can't enjoy the time away. Now you mentioned something, you said your, your morning walk. Is that, is that a routine for you? Actually it is um, going on a little over a month now, you know, I was getting some, so I'm aging like all of us, right? And then knocking on the door to 40. And I'm like, you know, I'm just kind of tired of, uh, you know, being sore and tired and exhausted by the end of the day. Um, yep. I walk a mile and a half to two miles every morning, um, even on my days off. And you'd be right. surprised. The first week was a struggle. Um, I'd get like a big crash around between that 2 and 3 p.m. Just like exhausted, right? You know, um, when you power through that and your body starts adjusting, just kind of the natural energy you have, it, it's, I never would have thought in a million years i could feel this way but it feels great it definitely helps clear the mind too that's good yeah that's when i was off on covid leave um i got up to where i was walking five miles a day uh and i dropped a ton of weight i felt really good and then when i got back to work it's something that i never seemed to to make time for and uh, i probably should because you you joke you're knocking on the door of 40 i'm knocking on the door of 50 <laughs> and um so i mean it's like you know, I, and I'm not looking for sympathy, but it's, it is something that when I think about how much better I felt when I moved around that much, uh, when I was off, um, and not carrying that extra little bit of weight, I really need to get back to that, but it's trying to find that commitment. Like, uh, I'm probably five miles from work, so I could essentially say, okay, I'm going to get up early enough and walk to work. Right. And then how do I get home? Cause I'd be walking almost 10 miles a day instead of five. So it's little things like that. Do I get a bike? Well, a bike versus walking is not the same. I find anyway, exercise. And, um, I don't like it. I'd rather walk. I could walk for hours and be, like you said, you, you clear your thoughts. You think about, you know, uh, the things you're facing at work, things in life. It's a really good way to decompress, but it is, and I, I noticed too after you know like the walking, just your thought process too when you're at work and you get one of those complex issues, or it doesn't always have to be complex. Just uh, your thought process, you, it seems like you're a lot more calmer too. You know when you go about it, you know you not you don't get as agitated as easy. I mean we all have our days still, but 
you know, yeah. um, as a whole, it's just, it's a lot better. Yeah. So what's a, what's a day to day for you? A day to day for me? Well, I usually get up, um, I'm in the central time zone here. You, you said you're in the Eastern, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So central time here, I get up at about quarter to five, um, Monday through Friday, I'm um, five on the weekends. And then I, I do my walk, you know, like we had spoke about. Um, from there, I get home. I do probably at most of us do have my coffee. I do a lot of scrolling and trolling sometimes there. Sometimes I like to stir the pot. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I, I, I work in uh, Moorhead, Minnesota, which is about a 20 minute drive from where I live. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm positioned about six miles north of Fargo, North Dakota in a right. s- small town called Harwood. And yeah, and I work in uh, Moorhead, an independent shop, kind of a, quite a, about 20 years here this year in, in the automotive career. So I got quite a vast array of knowledge there, um, anywhere from dealership to corporate level stuff to a lot of independent experience. So kind of well-rounded, kind of been around the block, I guess. So <laughs> Yeah. Um, how did you get into it? Well, I grew up on a farm um, in southeast North Dakota with my mom and my stepdad. Um, we didn't have any livestock or animals or anything, but, you know, we farmed uh, barley, wheat, and soybeans at the time. And it was a really rural community, you know, farming community, uh, Lidgerwood, North Dakota, um, for if anybody's bored and wants to Google it. Town of about 700. Um, but, wow. yeah, from there, um, you know, farming. So we are always fixing machinery, right? And then yeah. so when I'm, you know, junior – senior always did well in school but I like to you know work hard and and kind of screw off too and I'm like well I'll just go to college so I even got a you know a two-year degree for it too at uh, Wahpeton uh, the North Dakota State College of Science um and yeah for whatever reason uh, the industry trapped me uh, <laughs> can't get out of it so stick with uh, what I'm, you're good at I guess I mean yeah that's it and you know I I've said it so many times some of us I just I literally think we're just put here to do this you right. know, because I didn't, I didn't grow up wanting to be a mechanic. Um, my father was an auto body guy and I, so I grew up around cars, but I, I didn't, when I was in high school, even think for one second, I was going to be a mechanic. I didn't make the decision to be a mechanic until I'd already graduated. And I was sitting there just, I had, I worked at two different gas stations, pumping gas while I was graduated and was, what am I going to do with my life? And, uh, my stepbrother had gone through and was becoming a heavy equipment diesel tech. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to go do that. Because I mean, I had a, I had a 75 Malibu at the time that my dad and I nice. had uh, put together and, um, body wise, we put it together. It was a rusted hull when we got it. And, um, but it ran terrible. It needed an engine. It needed like a lot of work. And, um, so we were always tinkering on that, trying to get it, you know, a little more reliable, a little more, I was young. So it's like, I wanted to go faster not realizing that speed was even back then was a lot of money and right. now it's a stupid amount of money to go fast. So I never was like, I'm going to be a mechanic. I was just always working on cars. I had friends that were like the quote unquote gearheads who were way more into cars than I was, but it was like, I was always around them and it would be like, they'd be stuck with something. I'd just be like, well, let me look at it. And then it was like, it'd be fixed. And I don't, it's, so I don't want to say that it's genetic, but it just seemed to be that like I just approached it from a different directive and it, and it did trap me. And then, you know, I got into where I'd been doing it before I knew it, I was doing it 10 years. And then after like 10 years was like, well, what else am I going to do? You know, right. there was lots of times I almost walked away from it. I really did. But, you know, looking uh, back now, I kind of, I thought the same thing. I was doing a little reflecting the other day and, uh, so, you know, after my two years of college, um, I moved right to Fargo there and I started at a, at a dealership, right? But um, yeah. back then, even though I'm still fairly young, I was still right in that generational deal where they, they shove you in quick loop for a year yeah. or two. And then you got to fight for what you get, sink or swim type mentality. And looking back at it now, I'm like, I must have been a special kind of crazy to stick with that. Changing oil for nine or ten bucks an hour and um, yeah. fluid changes for a year and a half. And then when you actually make the shift to the shop, thinking you know something and knowing you don't know a damn thing and uh, fighting to scrape together hours on flat rate, you know, with a really small guarantee. It's like, yeah, there must be some sort of passion there underneath the skin for it. So, what you know, in a way, Chris, Chris sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yep, not a problem. What manufacturer was that? What OE for the dealer? Um, it started out um, at uh, Gateway Chevrolet in uh, Fargo. And then um, 
through my time there. That was from like yeah, late 06. Um, I was with Gateway. I never thought I was going to leave the dealership, honestly. When I started, I thought it was great once I got into it. Um, but I was young enough then, and there was an older gentleman on the Gateway, um, also owns a Hyundai Nissan store. Okay. Um, but he was throwing a stink working on them. So I was basically voluntold because I was young and moldable that, hey, we're going to move you to the Hyundai Nissan store. Yeah. Um, and I was scared shitless. But it, honestly, it was kind of a blessing in disguise as we kind of unfold here. Um, it really, I always grew up, you know, Ford, Chevy. I was a Chevy guy, but so that's what you're used to, right? So stepping yeah. out of your comfort zone. Um, little did I know, you know, almost 20 years down the road, that small change at that point in my life, kind of where it took me, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, it, it, it's a lot different way back then, even what a Hyundai like was compared to a Chevrolet, right? Chevrolet had had trucks, had this all right. these different product line, right, within the product line. Yeah, and then Hyundai, I can remember in 06 and 07, and I can remember Hyundai way back when they had the Pony. <laughs> That's yep. how old I am. Um, I can remember they were small, you know, small little, a few models. And such a different demographic, right? And probably, I know a lot of those guys that went to that, made that transition similar to you, like where they went to an import Asian brand years ago. They, once they were there, they tended to stay there because, you know, they, I want to say maybe they became that level of aptitude a little bit faster and then they just rode it, you know? Um, I'm not saying Hyundai is a good brand now. You look at how many of those engines. All the engines. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Feeling, right. Um, but I mean, I did my short little stint at Hyundai, and it wasn't for me. I did the cars were not hard to fix, not at all. Uh, they weren't hard to diagnose. I just remember being in there going like, the build quality in these is terrible. Like, how are you ever going to get somebody to invest in one of these as a ten year commitment, say, to a car? Right. We tend to think about, you know, if I'm going to buy a Chevrolet or a Ford or the domestics used to be, I'm going to you know keep that for ten years. Right. And you'd see the, the initial build quality on Hyundai was like, this sucker's not, it's going to be ready for the scrap heap by the time it's out of five-year warranty, you know? And that was crazy too, because what got a lot of people though was the price point at the time, yes. you know, now and everything is just outrageous. But one thing I did notice though, that I can elaborate on is it, the, the Hyundais were nice to work on. Um, the, the typical Hyundai owner was a little more receptive to maintenance versus, mm-hmm. you know, working on the big three. Oh, I mean, not, not fixed until it breaks or until it needs it. Nissan's just suck in general because they can oh. have five or 10,000 miles and they must use a special kind of metal, but it's like it, they rust and seize themselves. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they, you know, changed a little bit over the time, but yeah, Nissan's a whole nother demon. Um, but, but honestly, there's a time and even now just being well-rounded where, you know, Asians, even some Euros, like really don't scare me at all. Like you can kind of, it's kind of like a mindset, right? Once you understand kind of the the fundamentals of each platform, you can kind of, and, you know, accurate service information, you can kind of navigate and be like, all right, this is the route they're going down here. You know, you can kind of get on their, their thought level or their thought process, I guess. Yeah. I still recommend a high end day over a Nissan to anybody that asked me today. Oh yeah. Yeah. Night and day. It's... And then yeah. And then I always thought it was funny when I'd go for Hyundai training. Um, I got to gold level um, Hyundai certified technician in my tenure there. I didn't get to platinum because um, I'd left um, in the meantime. But um, the Hyundai Kia training center in, a, in Aurora, Illinois, the, their parts distribution center is the same place, but Kia okay. and Hyundai, they're kind of like a Kia is kind of like the, for lack of a better term, redheaded stepchild of Hyundai. But all their parts are coming right from the same horse's mouth, you know, and it's just like, I always laughed about it. So you get your Kia, your Optima, and your Sonata. It's the same car, a little bit different body panels, a little fancier yeah. radio in one. But yeah. yeah, and I, you know, the thing with Nissan that really was the frustration for me was it was the most user-unfriendly service information system I've oh, ever run. 100%. It was terrible. Uh, like, it was so inefficient. Uh, compared to anything else I'd ever seen in my life that like I wasn't the only one in the dealer I came on brand new uh, and I was like thank goodness they had a subscription to pro demand and I'd be using pro demand more than I'd be using the OE stuff and people would roll their eyes if you're listening to me now but if you've ever navigated the Nissan side trying to find the breakdown of the harness and then the location and then the pin out and then this like it'd be in four different sections of this not only that um, I don't know if you noticed this too, Jeff, but when you're looking at it, like the connector end view of the Nissans, 
you had it was like a mirror image so even though you're looking at it one way when you're at the connector it's the other way and i'm like that's stupid (laughs) yeah yeah oh it was and i did you ever like tech line i i can remember when i started like to work for chrysler tech line was a phone call and Mm -hmm. when i got to nissan it's like oh if you need to consult tech line i'm like okay how do i do that oh you send them an email right and it was (laughs) before they'd email you back i'm like what's the point of that like by the next day i'm not thinking about that car and you're on to something else and then somebody you go and get an email and you have to stop what you're doing switch your brain back to yesterday do an email response read it wait like it was the most inefficient thing in the world and i could call the guy and i could talk to charles say and then i could call charles back in two hours and go okay charles i did you know test abc like you said this is my result he guided me to something else i was just laughing with how ineffective nissan was it's um it's it's sad because their engines are i'm really impressed with some of the engines how durable i saw them but that transmission and that wiring was just crap like oh horrible Mm. i think that 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 cvt tran is even really well, oh. obviously really horrible, but now, what is it, Subaru? And I think, I'm trying to remember the other manufacturer that uses them, but it's not brand specific. It's kind of a, yeah. it's great when they work in one slip of the belt and the whole thing's trash. You might as well throw it away. <laughs> yeah, they're telling everybody, I know the local dealer here anyway, when everybody goes in to buy a Nissan and they're like, oh no, we don't use a CVT anymore. We went back to something completely different, you know, something more traditional, which I don't know. But, you know, I still have a friend that works, um, uh, an old mentor of mine that still works there 20 years there recently. And he, uh, and some of the, they still use some of the CVTs from my understanding. Well, they're, I don't know if they changed a little bit how they operate, but I know sometimes the salesmen are just trying to make a sale too. I think That's, we've all known that. Right. Cause I mean, I'm sure the techs are probably like, no, it's the same. Maybe they right. changed the food or software or something. But I, I, I can remember seeing like them come off the truck. And I know there was a couple, we had a couple of rogues that like the CVT was shot right when it was delivered for PDI. Oh, you know, wow. How does this ever happen? They're like, no, it's just, that's just what it is. It's, it's just terrible. Um, you know, high end day, when I was there, the transmissions were just starting to have some issues, but otherwise it was all engine work all day long. Front covers would leak. Uh, Timing you know, chain tensioners. Yeah, yeah, chain tensioners. The, I think it was at the 3.3 three Sonata. Yeah, that yeah. was I made a made a lot of money getting good at them because as every other manufacturer, Hyundai was really horrible at paying anything. Now when those yeah. timing chain tensioners went really bad, like right away, they'd pay like 14 hours to do them, and then you get creative and like I don't even have to remove the engine. I can lower the transmission mount, take the motor, you know, and then get it way up in the air, clean everything up nice, swap them out, be done in three four hours, and then uh, they caught wind of that, and then I think they dropped it to like 5.2 or 4.8 hours, and I'm like. That's a bunch of shit. <laughs> Chris, how do you think that that happens, that they find that out? Do you think, is it like, because we hear the old analogy and the guys are like, oh, guys go to class and they and they run their mouths and that's how they find out. Do you think that's how they find out or is it just like uh, I, you've got uh, clerks that are not doing their job and they're not running the full time and they submit the, the five hour and the OE goes, I don't care how they're doing it. We're just going to cut it to five. Um, a little acronym I developed in my, my – corporate side of it uh, you know i was a field service engineer for a couple of years but i like to call it wwr warranty waste reduction um mm-hmm. long story short you know big brother's kind of always watching so you know as with any corporate job you know there's rungs in a ladder and you just got to kind of be mindful of that because um <coughs> excuse me um you know just as a technician's job is to repair cars efficiently and make them some money um, you know, there's certain positions throughout any corporate business that it's their job to save the company money to help look, make them look better. So, um, yeah. I'll let you guys all kind of paint the picture of what can happen there. So, you know, if you get people popping through or like you said, two technicians kind of, um, speaking amongst themselves, um, at a training center, you got to kind of be careful for who's listening. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so it, it does, and there is some truth to that, that that's how that happens because, uh, you know, I always was like, I can remember being on a training for a sprinter class way back then. And before, mm-hmm. before the class started, there's the instructor in the class. He's just kind of, you know, shooting the breeze. And everybody's talking about, oh, what are you running into a lot of this and a lot of that? And it's like, oh, you hate that job? Here's the trick to do it. And they'd all be sharing freely information about how they, you know, 
right. buy this buy this Torx drive socket or this thing, and and you can, you know, shave time from doing this job. And it's like, and he's sitting there listening, and, and that's then, fine. And that's and it. Just, too. And I'm not completely cutting down on them. They're not intentionally trying to do it, but what they're doing is they're starting a, they're starting basically an investigation, you know, and then. You know, then you get people um, like uh, warranty admins, right? Um, a dealership has them. They submit them into their, their um, you know, whatever OE corporate to get paid. And they start looking at punch times. And they're like, all right, well, maybe there's some truth to this here. We're paying this. Um, heck, we'll use 10 hours, you know, for a round number. Yep. But I never see more than an hour and a half of punch time or three hours, you know. And then they start, you know, eventually start putting two and two together. So, I mean, I get both sides of it. Yeah. But it's like one of those deals, you know, as a technician at heart, like we, you know, all are. Um, there's certain things that, you know, like, hey, I cracked, I, I cracked the puzzle, right? I solved the riddle. So I want to help, you know, a few select people get there. But then you got to be careful who you're sharing your, your tricks with, you know, it's like, it, it's like diagnosing a vehicle now sometimes. And then, you know, people are all like, you know, services by, well, why are we charging two hours diag? You had that done in 15 minutes. And I'm like, you want to know how I was able to get to this in 15 minutes? This is the procedure and process I developed over 20 years of doing this. That's why yeah. we're charging that, you yeah. know? So it's all the stuff you got to take into account, you know, stuff we, you and I know, and most of our listeners probably know, but it's, you know, nature of the beast. You get called a gatekeeper though. You right. Well, <laughs> you do. I've been called a lot of things for, uh, uh, my mouth has gotten me in trouble over the years. You know, sometimes I offered my opinion when it wasn't welcomed, but you, mm -hmm. it, like anything else, you know, there, there's times where, you know, it's welcomed and there's, you know, times you got to bite your tongue, but it's like, I, I'm very passionate about what I do. Right. So even though it's not my business, my hands are still involved in it. Right. My name is still on there. You know, I like to make at least known that, Hey, this is how I do it. And this is why I do it. And I'd love to have a discussion, but sometimes they, you know, sometimes it's, taken well and sometimes they're not as receptive about it you know because i get it it's not my business you know it's their business but um there's no malice intent ever you know it's like ugh, i've been down this road right i i've beat my head against the wall i've got this burnt me bad this is why i do it this way you know and right. most people are pretty receptive but it's a learning experience every life's always in session right you know yeah. every day is a new day so can I ask you how you transitioned from being a technician to getting into that kind of, like you said, that more of that admin side when you were with, um, who you were with? So in a nutshell, so I was with the dealership Hyundai Nissan until, um, 2013, um, long story short there, just how they were running it at the time. Um, I was going to a lot of training, right. Doing a lot of the warranty work. And I was also helped bring in a lot of younger techs and me up to speed. And then my customer pay work would get given to them because it had to get done. And I'm right. sitting there trying to make a check off warranty work. So I left the dealership world and corporate world and went into the independent world for would have been six or seven years. Right. Um, and I was at three different independent shops in that time. Um, they were all, great along the way you know um the first one i just kind of i was the import guy when i first left the dealer that's kind of how i got out of there and i wouldn't get any other work they would kind of spoon feed a couple other techs there and if they didn't want to work on it they'd ship it out and send it to the dealer and i you know i'd get frustrated i'm like you know i can work on that let me work on that but so after a couple of years of that um i left that and went to another independent um did well there got a lot more training there um, but at the time at that independent, they're always dangling the carrot in front of you. Right. So it was kind of a salaried position, but I felt at the time the goalpost always got moved, you know, to earn and, and level up. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes there'd always be an excuse of why, and I'm, it wasn't for me. Right. I'm like, you know, if you actually count all the hours and the time and stuff like that, and then, and then everything that was supposed to be, you know, mandatory at the time it wasn't, it was good money, but not that great. Right. So then right. I went to, I downsized and went to a smaller independent, which I loved. I probably would still be there now. Um, but I, one of my f uh, close friends that moved back closer to Michigan now at the time, his uh, kid and my kid were in the same soccer deal and he was an AC Delco rep at the time. Okay. And he's like, you know, you should really apply. General Motors is looking at field service engineers. Um, and I think he'd be a good fit, you know, cause he'd pop into our store and 
um, and stuff like that. And so I applied and, and it was kind of, a, it was a really long process from when I submitted my application and resume to the hiring deal, but it was about five or six months. And then I finally got, um, got all that done. I let it accepted because I don't think there's a lot of people knocking down the door to move to North Dakota anyhow and kind of take over the North Dakota, uh, Western yeah. Minnesota, and then Northeastern South Dakota was kind of my region. Um, loved the job, met a lot of really, really unique, um, awesome people, way smarter people than me as well. It helped me kind of think outside the box and not, you know, not being the go-to guy and me having to be seeking out the go-to. Um, it was a very humbling experience. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of helped speed up my career even you know um but just like anything else um you know life happens um i had some life changes happening you know sorting out my own problems and stuff and then unfortunately i you know i had to resign um there were some certain things going on at the time with my driving capabilities of just uh where i wasn't going to be able to perform and do it right yeah. so i had to I had to take a local job, which turned out to be a blessing in disguise anyway. Um, you know, I'm earning more than I ever have. I'm really excelling. Um, I'm finding my, you know, purpose and meaning in life in that being a field service engineer was a, was a huge stepping stone to really accelerate my aftermarket career. Um, mm -hmm. It got me listening to like you guys. It got me, you know, um, you know, Scanner Danner, Paul Danner, um, you know, Sean Tipping, all them. It, they gave, and you, you know, you guys gave me a new passion for, for the career. You know, I was, a lot of people around here want to just be parts hangers. And then, you know, that got to me too. And I'm like, God, what am I doing in my life? Um, then I started just geeking out on these podcasts and, and got back in the independent world. I've been, you know, wrenching um, in Moorhead, like I said, for a little over a year now again. And I'm just starting to really thrive career-wise and everything. So um, the field service engineer thing for ac delco that's not the dealership level that's like are you going from like what's that entail going from helping with problem cars yep at, we're basically yeah. an extension of tech line is what i was i had 58 dealerships that i um basically serviced um and we would go around and make sure basically help troubleshooting right you know like mobile di mobile techs mobile diet that's basically kind of like what we were only you know working for corporate we we're a corporate employee so i was an employee of General Motors um, itself, um, which it, it was great. Uh, we'd go around and basically like assist the dealers in making sure they're they're have their special essential service tools as they should. We'd work hand in hand with the technician that was having troubles with the vehicle. In my area, um, sometimes I think I got abused because in the remote area I'm in, a lot of the techs didn't always, weren't always up to date on their training, right? And if they weren't getting paid or had the training certifications to submit for the OLH, was what they called for the extra hours, they weren't getting paid, right? So they, right. some of them would be way too quick to hit the easy button. So it was kind of a juggling act sometimes. You have to kind of be like, all right, which ones are kind of crying wolf? Which ones here? Give them this little bit of information. Make them send you back information to kind of make sure they're being engaged with the problem and not just hitting the easy button. And, and it was a juggling act though, cause you had to be careful because some of them dealerships and some of them technicians, they'd throw a big enough stink. The customer would call in, start complaining. And then you have to be more proactive, right? You have to get down there and, and have that conversation with the service managers, the dealer principals and say, Hey, you know, I'm here to help. Yes. But you know, I'm also, you know, not necessarily here to do your job. You know, technically you guys are the t servicing shop. They're your customer. Um, you know, you have to have a lot of difficult conversations sometimes. But uh, So did you tend to, I wanted to always ask this if I could ask somebody that was in that position. Most of the time when you get there and the, the, the car is not repaired, it's got an issue. Mm -hmm. Did you find that it's technician competency or is it technician compensation that was the biggest obstacle in them fixing the car? I'm going to say a little of both. Um, yeah. I'm not going to lie. I made a lot of trips uh, when I physically asked over the phone, um, did you check pin fit? Mm -hmm. um, I can't count countless vehicles that I fixed with pin fit issues. Yeah. Um, the lot of the thing I've realized is the newer these vehicles are getting when they're going to like the micro 50 pin fit connectors, people are trying to shove their micro 60s into there. And they're like, no, I checked it. It's tight. Well, they hogged out the pin, right? So yeah. I take the proper pin, put it in the connector and hold it up and my terminal tool falls right out. I'm like, get a new connector, get a new harness, plug this in, you know, and send me the screenshot. It's going to fix it, right? Um, yep. 
And then there's some of it too. You can just tell some of the dealers where the, you know, service managers may not be, they're there, but they're not, they're mentally, right. ab, you know, and they're just not engaged. There's some dealers, you know, and I'm not trying to knock on the dealers, you know, because I mean, there's independent shops, you know, I have my days too, right? But it's just, this is the stuff I, I witness because I'm pretty observant. So like when I, you know, you can kind of pick up on body language to people when you're talking to them and you can just tell the ones that are there, the ones that are just filling a chair and doing the bare minimum. And it's frustrating because a lot of these same places have very talented techs or techs that have a lot of potential, but they're just not, they're not given the proper tools, right? Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes it's just flat out heartbreaking because it's like, you know, too much more and this one's just going to leave. And are they mm -hmm. going to come back? Are they going to try something different? Or are they going to just go to a whole nother career? You don't know. Yeah. Um, but there's only so much one person, you know, me, you know, can do too. Sometimes I got to stay in my own lane and worry about my workload and what I had to do too. And, you know, just help them fix the car and move on. Yeah. I've really seen that dynamic. Sometimes you can see it now as I'm more of an outside, I'm not an outsider. But I, I've been I've become more in tune that I can kind of watch how the designated leader in a in a facility, how everyone else reacts around them is a very tell to what their level of respect for that person is. And oftentimes, as sad as it is, that manager's aptitude as well. Because like some of them, I worked for some that you knew they were no kind of tech in their in their in their day, which was fine. They're not necessarily right. one a higher service manager i want the sharpest tech in the world but there comes a level of respect sometimes with a guy that can really go and bail you out of a problem or just come to you and say have you thought about it like this when i'm talking to a manager and he has like i'm over his skill level with how i'm approaching it and you can see that like the the wheels are the lights are on but there's nobody kept picking up what i'm putting down it becomes very hard for me to then consider that person my leader you know what i mean right it's, yep. it's, it's tough because I don't need him to bail me out, but I need him to have my back and I need him to be able to bounce ideas off of, but like, cause at the end of the day, I don't want to waste anybody's time. I don't want to waste anybody's money either as a technician, right? Flat rate or not in the shop I want. So if I'm working at a place and it's like, he's not at my level and it's getting hard, I'm not bragging, but it's getting hard to find a tech that I can bounce ideas off of that right. doesn't see me on a, a goose chase or doesn't have me going oh i've already come on now dude like i've already checked that that's what have been step one it's struggle i struggle with it and i see i've seen some shops where they're like you can just kind of tell the violence of the tech when they're looking at the manager they're like yeah no it, it we're we're sunk here because we can't lean on him right and then right. it's like we call in we call in the service the field service guy so it's well, kind of like even you know transitioning out of that back into the independent in, <clears throat> excuse me independent world it uh like when i whip out my pico at uh at the shop like when i first did it in relative compression they're like what do you what are you doing there we need to do a compression test when you do this i'm like no we don't yeah and then they just start they give they give me the deer in the headlight look and i'm like no see check this out i mean that you know the voltage doesn't lie you know we can do this 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 and this and you don't have to tear this apart and we can move it out and bring the next one in and it yep. took me a few months to like get that to sync and then also though there you know there's always a downfall with the relative uh um, compression too. I mean, you, it's a good baseline, right? But you still need mm -hmm. to sometimes dive in a little deeper. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just like, you know, showing them some efficiencies, you know, and how to streamline stuff. Um, I mean, in, in the past 14 or 15 months that, you know, I've been back in the independent world, the little shop we were in, we since had got out of that and we have this, you know, beautiful eight, nine, 10 base shop we just moved into. Um, and, you know, we're growing as a company. And I just think it's kind of unique how, you know, timing everything. You know, I, I am a firm believer that, you know, through life, things happen for a reason, right? They, they help right. learn, shape, and mold us. Good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, life happens, right? So, I mean, it's it's been a great journey. Um, I work for some, you know, great people now. I mean, we still have our differences, but we actually talk mm -hmm. through them, right? And we see both yeah. sides of it. We can have conversations and not hold resentments. And that's important. Yeah, it's I've been I've been very blessed in that. Like I keep saying that um, this job to me is still a relatively new job. I started in September, but now I'm coming up on it's like, well, before I know it, I'll be there a year. And this has been the easiest first year that I've ever had in a place. You know what I mean? So it's I'm I'm over the moon ecstatic with that because I can just see there's no limits in front of me. There's no barriers, right? Like I don't look at it and go. 
uh, well, I'm, I'm probably going to top out at this level in terms of the kind of problems that I'm going to get or the pay. Right. Like, I don't see any obstacles in front of me. And that's, that's rare for me because most places that I started a new job, you could see them within about six months. <clears throat> and excuse me. And so I'm over the moon with happy with how this is going, you know, and I, and I, I hope out there for more people that they can find that. And it doesn't have to be like, sometimes people are like, yeah, you know, he's always ripping on dealers and it's not. I mean, I I've said it as well. If it wasn't for a dealer, I wouldn't have been in this industry still wouldn't be doing it. Cause I would 100%. not have survived. wouldn't have survived where I was at the independent way back in, in 2000. If I'd have stayed in an independent, the one I was at, I wouldn't have survived. And I can guarantee you right now, people don't want to hear it. They were all the same back then. They could not like, there wasn't a whole lot of young people in the independence, every independent that I walked around and knew they were all like much older than me, 10, 12, 15, 20 years older than me. The dealerships were full of young people. Now right. I think the other way around where the dealerships have a lot of old heads and the independent shops seem to have the young people. And I, I'm not sure if that's a great sign or not, because I don't know how the mentorship thing is happening. Who's got maybe uh, a leg up on it. Um, and I don't know but, if you've, uh, noticed this and I, I can't speak, you know, like I said, we're not knocking on dealers, but we're right in a unique time. I'm finding not necessarily like better, but more like, I don't even know the right word to use for it there to not really offend anyone, but there, there's some interesting talent in the independent world versus a dealer. Sometimes, you know, back when I've, you know, 20 years ago when I started, the dealer is like the pinnacle. You bring it here and they're going to figure out your make model and whatever. And that's not always the case anymore. Um, I've, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people that fix stuff that, you know, either A, didn't want to put any more money at where I was working at the time or whatever got kicked down the road. But I know I've personally fixed a lot of stuff that's been to two, three, you know, four shops. And it's easy. I mean, I get it. You know, tunnel vision happens. There's stuff I've mm-hmm. overlooked before and any tech, it, we're human, right? You know, yeah. we're not... We're not programmable machines, you know, we're, you know, we got the human error with us, but, you know, that's, and I know why at the same time, but, you know, and I don't know the hundred percent way to fix it, but, you know, the, the OEs are trying to save money, right? And, and then everybody's like, well, the dealers don't have to pay their tax flat rate, but I'm like, well, you know, the dealers making their money like their shop is by billing hours out, right? And collecting money. Well, you still need to collect that XYZ amount to pay this person that somehow form, you know, way, shape or form. So if the technicians at the dealer aren't doing their training to qualify to get this, the extra labor time for the rare and weird conditions and the dealership's not collecting money for it, you know, how do you expect a dealer to pay, you know, for a round number, a te- a, you know, good worthwhile technician, a hundred thousand a year, not on flat rate, just a hundred thousand a year, but you know, they're only collecting 60 labor hours, you know, pay period from the OE on warranty work, yeah. you know, that's not justifiable either. No. Um, and, and the D and the OEs are pushing, well, we need to get the, you know, the text of training, the text of training. Um, but still it's like the prize for some newer tech is not, the reward's not great enough yet. I don't think it's quite there yet to incentivize them to do this because, you know, it, for majority of the dealers, it's still kind of a flat rate environment, you know, because that's the, that's the revenue coming in. And we talked to so many guys, eh, Chris, that it's like the more up on their skills they got, the more certs they got within the OE, the harder the work became and the less money they made. That Even happened if- to me. I mean, yeah. I like remember we were just talking about that. I had to, I was doing all the warranty work because the techs technically couldn't to get submitted mm-hmm. under their technician number. So my customer pay work was kind of getting handed off to them because it had to be done, right? It had the customers coming to get it. And I'm like, once yes twice okay this was happening multiple times during this time period um when i was there and i just had enough i'm like you know my timing belt and spark plug and 60k services are getting given away and but here's this 3 tenth recall we need you to do and here's this 8 tenth airbag clock spring recall and don't forget to test drive it and inspect it and Mm -hmm. i have to run my ass off to get eight hours a day and i'm there for 10 hours and i'd stay late to do three four pdis to get my hours up it's like i'm working it's all the time I got involved into my career and you break it down before and after hours, I'm making minimum wage, <laughs> you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, the recall thing was funny for me because it was like, it seemed to be that when I was at the dealers, the first thing that any of them seemed to learn certs or not was how to do the recalls. Right. Like 
you know, the airbag recalls, we were all doing them. Even if the guy had been there maybe only three, four months, he didn't take any kind of Nissan training. He was doing the recalls, you know, mm-hmm. and they, they paid well. It was the same as when I was way back at when I was at Chrysler. Now, I don't know in the background maybe if they were submitting all the claims underneath the foreman's number. And then, you know, to in order to get them paid by warranty, I don't know. And it's not really that important. Right. Um, it's, it makes me laugh when I see, not laugh, but I feel for the guys that are like, yeah, I got all my certs and then I got handed all the recalls because the, the rest of the guys that could do a timing belt didn't bother to get the certs so they could do the recall. First of all, your shop culture is broken because if he can do a timing belt, he can do just about any recall that's been ever given. And if he didn't get right. certified to do it, he needs to be working somewhere else, right? Yeah, or sit there on his yep. toolbox until he has a job that he can go get in his, his certification done. And then he can start to give you dispatch work. I never understood that because for me, a straight re and re job under warranty, I never had a problem with. Cause after I did it two, three times, it wasn't hard to hit it. Right. My thing was always having to fight to do the diag. And I'll give you the example, the cars that would come in and it's like, Oh, well, it's got a remote starter that just put in last week, but now it's got this electrical issue. Um, we know that it's not really technically supposed to be there. And by warranty, we can't make a claim if the warrant, you know, if it's causing it, but just see what you can do with it, you know, to figure out, make sure that it's not that. Right. And you, it's <laughs> like, hey, guess what? You know, I unplug all that stuff or I cut it all back out. And the problem that the car has is gone. And they'd say, well, we can't pay you. I don't know how we're going to pay you because that wasn't supposed to be in there. You You're charge even, the customer, <laughs> right? You know, <laughs> you don't want to, right, Chris? Because it's like, well, yeah. We want him to buy another Chrysler three years from now or two years from now or maybe six months from now. Like, oh, he's a good, you know, good customer for sales, right? We want him to buy another car. That was the part that always made me, that drove me to quit. Because it's like it shouldn't, or you'd see them and it's like, wait a minute, this has been in a body shop. You know, and it's like, I can remember one out of Caliber and that they have that fuse box that was in the fender well on the driver's side. It was mounted upside down. It didn't come from the factory mounted upside down. You started to peel it apart and you're looking for this problem. And it's like, whoa, this has been in an accident. Well, that's how it got turned upside down is when they put the car back together. I'm right. not faulting the guy at the body shop, but all of a sudden, if it fills up with water now and it fails, that's not a warranty defect. That's something that they have to go back to the customer and say, hey, sorry, we found this. You know, um, it sucks. So you either need to pay us and make a claim against your insurance or you just need to pay us a tech. We can't make that claim, but they just slide it through somehow and you're not paying me the full amount and not piss off the customer. And it just was to the words end, I was done with it. You know, I'd had it. I was, it didn't make sense to me. I just wanted to show up, make a good living, you know, and it, I couldn't because the guys that didn't have to even think like that could bang 12, 14 a day. And I was lucky to get eight to 10 and it was right. like at the same rate. And I'm like, that's just not fair. And, um, and I think some of that in my experience is getting a little bit better. Um, we were still a long ways from perfect, but educating the customer before you buy it and letting them know hey, aftermarket accessories are, are, are just that, right? They're aftermarket. They yeah. didn't come with it. So if there is an issue with this, you will be on the hook for it. And I'm even seeing it more in our local dealers too. Um, customer will come in and say, yeah, I had this at the dealer, but I had, they had to charge me for, you know, and, and whatever, right? It is what it is. And then they don't seem too worked up about it. But yeah, you know, like you said, you know, when I, was, I think it would be early 2010, 11, 12, when I was still there, it didn't matter what was on the vehicle. If it had under 10,000 miles, the customer shouldn't have to pay for anything. And I'm like, they, I didn't put the stereo system in. I didn't put this Astro Start screen, whatever. You know, the, yeah. this didn't come factory. This is not normal. And it was hard to wrap that around some of the, the service advisors at the time because there, we, there was a period of time there when the the general manager at the time was trying to any used car say or any car salesman they're transitioning them as service advisors so then you know they're trying to cut you know sometimes customers a deal well it's come on well we can shave here well they're shaving the labor times i'm like you don't touch the labor times i told them like that's for the technician if you want to give them a discount put them down with the discount line take it off the whole ticket don't take it out of the technician's pocket and i i don't know how many conversations i had to have like that until i went blue in the face and then you you know, eventually you have enough, you get fed up and you're like, yeah. the hell with this, you know, nothing's going to change. I can't keep doing this, you know? Yeah. It's, and that's goes back to, cause dealerships at the end of the day, so many have missed the boat and they think that they exist and they do, they exist to sell cars. But right. like I was early enough in to know that really, wait a minute, the margin here on the car sales sucks. 
they're not making enough money to survive to sustain the dealer just on the profit that they get on generating the car all the money as big as most people think you know all the money gets made on the service after the fact so why are we continually screwing service department to move more cars like let's do the break down the math to a basic level here if i sell a caravan we make a thousand bucks on it whoop de do you know if i if if i keep that tech happy and he keeps motivated he keeps selling work he'll make a thousand dollars a week easily he can make a thousand dollars a day profit so why do we want to burn that department down but it's like nope oh i can't move these cars well you might be able to move them then but if you're everybody in your back is all burnt out you know and feels jaded um they're not going to make you enough money and they're certainly right. not going to take look after the customer the way you want and then your csi starts to hit the tank and before you know it your 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 audits won't get paid under warranty like it, it just goes on it's a, just a vicious cycle all because we have some salesmen in the sales department that just want to they believe that service exists to serve them and it's the other way around i believe that it's like sales exists to move the product service is there to service the product to keep the the lights turned on that's the way it is absolutely you know? yep but it's frustrating csi what was your take on that did you ever really pay it a whole lot of mind because i know i didn't i didn't even consider it when i was a technician um i didn't uh you know the, the more wisdom you get through the career though and my time as an fsc you know there was a csi score for fscs the service managers you know they get something sent to them right and you know was the was, was the fsc assisting you knowledgeable right and all this and okay. you know on the corporate side of things that that plays a huge role um as like one of your metrics too um you know so you, you got to be on your game you got to be helpful there, there's obviously things out of your control and most service managers get that too and you know on both sides of it you know corporate side and 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 the dealership side of it but um you know the csi a lot of dealerships the service advisors that csi is a huge part of of their pay mm -hmm. um if they don't get all five or whatever a completely satisfied csi review like we're, we're, we're talking like thousand two thousand dollar hits a month depending on how their commission structure is set um it and it's good you know there's some customers though you know you're just never gonna make happy you could do you could give them the car for free and they're not gonna be freaking happy and there's right. always gonna be some of that right but um <laughs> my biggest problem is is nine I'm going to say 99 times out of 100 when there is a bad CSI, whether it's at a dealership or, ind or independent or just a bad Google review, it is 100% communication. It, it's something yep. got lost in the process. Too many people trying to, too many chiefs, you know, trying to relay a message, right? And not being forthcoming with the customer, letting yep. them know the full expectations upon arrival. Like, hey, this is what, this is what's going to happen. This is the conversation we're going to have, you know, and there's going to be one of two ways we're going to go here. And, um, communication is everything and and that just not even just in our industry just in life in general i think that's where most of frustration confusion and everything comes from good stuff from chris higgins on this episode of the jaded mechanic podcast that'll do it for part one of jeff and chris their conversation part two we'll wrap it up next week be sure to listen hey if you could do me a favor real quick and like comment on and share this episode i'd really appreciate it and please, most importantly, set the podcast to automatically download every Tuesday morning. As always, I'd like to thank our amazing guests for their perspectives and expertise. And I hope that you'll please join us again next week on this journey of change. Thank you to my partners in the ASA group and to the Change in the Industry podcast. Remember what I always say, in this industry, you get what you pay for. Here's hoping everyone finds their missing 10 millimeter, and we'll see you all again next time.